Well, good evening and welcome to my tutorial on how to shoot the Aurora. We're going to have a beautifully clear night here and it's the shortest night of the year. The summer solstice, June 21st. But most importantly, Aurora apps and websites are indicating we might get a display of northern lights tonight. So just in case, I've come to the shore of a small lake here in southern Alberta in hopes of capturing still images and time-lapse movies of the northern lights dancing over the lake waters. Well, we've got a little while to wait before it gets dark, so in the meantime, let me review what you need to shoot the northern lights and tell you a little bit about the science behind the northern and the southern lights. The source of the aurora lies 150 million kilometers away, at the sun. Flares and explosions on the sun blow clouds of charged particles into space. These are CMEs, coronal mass ejections. Some are hurled toward Earth, where they intercept our planet's magnetic shields. During a storm, solar particles rain down onto our atmosphere forming rings of light around the magnetic poles, created by glowing oxygen and nitrogen molecules. During an intense display, auroras can stretch across the continent. When maps of the auroral ovals light up yellow and red, displaying data from a fleet of Sun and Earth monitoring satellites that provide us with space weather forecasts. When the Sun sends storms our way, they light up the auroral ovals around both the North and the South magnetic poles, creating often identical displays of Northern and Southern lights. Both occur high in our atmosphere, 100 to 500 kilometers up. The space station often flies through the tops of the aurora. So whether you're shooting the aurora borealis or the aurora australis, the gear is the same. The best camera by far is a DSLR. Now compact system mirrorless cameras can produce great results, but framing the scene uh, on a dark night through their electronic viewfinders can be a little tough. And low-cost point-and-shoot cameras and cameras on mobile devices have such small sensors, their images are going to look very ugly and very noisy if they pick up anything at all. So by far the best choice is a DSLR camera. And it's best to use a fast wide-angle lens. A lens speed of f2.8 or faster allows you to use shorter shutter speeds to better capture the moving curtains of the aurora. Or to use a lower ISO speed for lower noise. I'm using a 24 millimeter lens tonight, but I've used lenses as wide as eight millimeter fish eyes for those spectacular displays that cover the entire sky. The camera also needs to be on a solid tripod. Ideally, it should be one that you can adjust quickly to reframe displays as they move quickly around the sky. Now to avoid bumping the camera, you need a remote release of some type. Now, if you have a remote with intervalometer functions, that allows you to shoot hundreds of frames in rapid succession to create a time-lapse movie later in processing. Now, if an aurora appears, it can be exciting, but take the time to focus. Use Live View and zoom in on a bright star or distant light and focus carefully. Then take test exposures with the camera set on manual. Start with an ISO setting of 1600 to 3200 and with the lens at f2 to f4. Then try shutter speeds of 5 to 30 seconds. Now how long a shutter speed you need depends on the brightness of the aurora and of the sky at your sight. To freeze the motion of a fast moving aurora you might need to use short shutter speeds requiring high ISO speeds. Whatever you do, don't underexpose. There's nothing worse than dark images that barely show a dim green glow. Give the image enough exposure to bring out the foreground, to put the aurora in a scene. 
then take the time to level the camera and compose the scene. Because there is something worse than badly exposed images, and that's badly composed images, especially ones that are crooked. Well, the predictions proved reasonably accurate, and Aurora did develop. There's a nice oval, a nice arc across the northern sky, not particularly bright to the naked eye, but nevertheless, photographically, it shows up very nicely, makes for some pretty still pictures, and I've got the camera going in time-lapse, shooting 15 second long exposures at one second interval at ISO 3200. So we'll see what we get in terms of a time-lapse movie and still images. Well, that was a great night out at the lake. The aurora came up just as expected and danced over the lake waters. I shot about 360 frames for a time-lapse movie, and I'll, I'll show you the process of assembling those frames into a movie. But I'll also take one representative frame, well, the best frame from the sequence, and process that as a still image. Now, the workflows I'm going to show you are professional workflows. First of all, we're dealing with raw files, and I, I forgot to tell you out in the field, you really need to shoot raw for the best image quality. But also, working with raw files is non-destructive. Anything we do to them, we can undo later on, or change, as we uh, might change our mind later on when we look at that picture later. I'm going to be going through Adobe Bridge, then into Adobe Camera Raw to process the raw files, and then we'll take it into Photoshop for some finishing touches to the still image. However, if you prefer to use Adobe Lightroom, its develop module is exactly the same as Adobe Camera Raw. So anything I do in ACR, you could do in Lightroom as well. So again, it's professional workflow, non-destructive, working with raw files. We'll start with a still image, then we'll do a time lapse. So let's get started. Now, I've imported the raw files into a folder on my hard drive and pointed Adobe Bridge at that folder, and here they are. 360 images or so, and scrolling through the images actually gives us a bit of a sneak preview of the time lapse. Now, with Lightroom and with Bridge, we can flag images. We can give them star ratings or color labels. Uh, in this case, I've gone through the set and given one image that I want to process as a still image, a four star rating. Clicking the filter over here shows us just that one image. And if I open it up, it opens up, in this case, in Adobe Camera Raw. Now, I've already done all the developing to that image, but I'll just step through and show you what it is I've done. First of all, I usually go over here to the lens correction panel. And here, Enable Lens Profile Corrections really makes a big improvement to the image. It brightens up those dark vignetted corners and corrects uh, some of the aberrations and shortcomings of the lens that it knows what was attached to the camera, in this case a 24 millimeter lens. So Lens Corrections is a great place to start. Over here under the Detail panel is Sharpening. It defaults at about 25 and that's usually pretty good. It defaults at a color noise reduction of about 25, and it's usually pretty good. But it defaults at zero luminance, and I brought it up to about 50 here, and I'll just show you the difference. You gotta zoom right in to see that difference into about 200% in this case. And if I go down here and toggle this button here, it turns off the luminance noise reduction back to the default at zero, and it's pretty gritty, it's pretty noisy. Turning it back on really smooth things out. So the luminance noise reduction, you really have to bring up by a varying amount. Don't bring it up too much. It will kind of smooth out detail. But uh, what high ISO shots, 40 or 50 is pretty good. So that's the detail panel. Now going back to the basics panel here, again, I've slid all kinds of sliders here and made a great difference, improvement, I think, to the image. Toggling them all off back to their zero default level shows you what the image looked like coming out of the camera. A little overexposed, a little pale, a little washed out. But turning on the sliders really snaps it up. One of the main ones that made a difference was highlights here. Bringing down the highlights brought out recovered detail in the brighter roll curtains. Bringing exposure down also 
uh, help, down about, about half an f-stop in this case. Sometimes the exposures you use to begin an auroral sequence, by the time the aurora gets really bright, are a little too much, but you can recover detail in those bright curtains. Bringing up contrast sometimes helps uh, a little bit. Shadows, turning up shadows brings out detail in the dark shadows, but we don't have too many of those here. Bringing up clarity can help snap up the mid-tone contrast. Doesn't make a big difference here, but vibrance really does snap up those subtle purples and magentas in this particular case. The color balance was pretty good coming out of the camera, but you can use these tint and temperature sliders to correct the color balance if it's a little off. So again, here's without and here's with. And in just a few minutes here, we made a big difference uh, to the image and really improved it quite a bit. So that's all we, that's presentable even as is, but we can take it into Photoshop and, and do a little bit more with the image. So that's next. Well, making all those adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw or in Lightroom would probably take no more than two or three minutes. In our case, it's given us an image that looks pretty good to go. But we can improve upon it a little more, I think, by going into Photoshop. And to do that, we hit the Open Image button or by hitting the Shift key. That becomes Open Object. And now, when we hit that button, Adobe Photoshop opens up. And that image opens in Photoshop as a smart object. And a smart object is a kind of image layer that you can apply filters to, again, non-destructively, to continue non-destructive processing. And this little insignia here down in the bottom of the image tells you that it is a smart object. And one of the things we can do to a smart object in this case is, should we decide to change our mind and we kind of like to go back and readjust some of those sliders and settings in Camera Raw, no problem. Just double click on the image and it opens up back in Camera Raw again and there's our image, and we could readjust any of those settings that we made to it and tweak it if we changed our mind. But I won't in this case, I'll just press cancel, and there's our image ready to be worked on. I'll zoom in on full screen. Now we'll apply a smart filter. So one smart filter I like to apply is a little more noise reduction. Uh, zooming in again, just so you can see the difference, if I go under filter, noise, Reduce noise. Dialog box comes up with, again, options for strength, color noise, details, sharpen details. These are kind of my standard settings, and you can save them as a preset to apply very quickly in the future. Hit OK, and it applies another subtle level of noise reduction here. We'll just let it apply, show you the before and after. There it is with, hit Command Z or Command Z. Uh, to undo it, there it is, there is without, there is with, without. So again, it's another subtle noise reduction, but uh, certainly helps in, in high ISO images. Now something else we can do, oh, let's just put that filter back in, there we are. Something else we can do is under image, adjustments, shadows and highlights. Now, shadows and highlights, something we did earlier on under Camera Raw, but we can do another, again, round of shadows and highlights. Those are the default settings, and looks a little ugly. Uh, just back off the shadows here quite a bit. Back off the highlights even here a little bit. Maybe bring up the tone a little bit. Bring up the mid-tone contrast here a bit. Uh, change the radius sometimes helps bring out a little more detail. Let's see, just turn off the preview, on the preview off, on, and again, we're just recovering a little more highlights in those quite bright auroral curtains, and that can really help in the case of an aurora that does come up very bright and might tend to overexpose. So that's shadows and highlights, and it is again applied as a non-destructive filter. Like reduced noise, if we were to double click on that filter, the shadows and highlights box would reopen up again, and we can readjust those sliders, as we often need to do. Uh, didn't like it the first time, we can adjust it a little bit more and tweak things a bit and then readjust it. So at any time in the future, you can change your mind and, and tweak things. That's the beauty of professional non-destructive processing. So that's just a couple of things we've done to the image as smart filters. Uh, there's lots more we could do with the image, but let's say we're happy with that. We now, of course, save it 
Uh, but we want to save it as a layered Photoshop file to preserve those smart filters and any other adjustment layers you might add. We haven't done any, any of those. Save that as your master file. Then if you want to se send a JPEG or a TIFF or something to somebody else or to post on Facebook, then flatten it, but save it as a JPEG, TIFF or whatever. So always keep your layered Photoshop master file. So that's one still image processed, uh, but we've got 360 others in our folder. Uh, how do we process those if we wanted to turn them into a time-lapse movie? Well, that's next. Well, to begin the process of creating a time-lapse movie, uh, let's go back to Bridge here in this case. And there's our one image that we processed, the four-star image, with the processing settings applied. And we'd like to do the same thing to it as to all the other images. Well, I don't have to open up 300-odd images and process them, go through the same process I just did with that one image. Instead, let's pick the image we did process, go under here, right-click, Develop Settings, Copy Settings, and then Command or Control A to select all, click anywhere else, Right-click, Develop Settings, Paste Settings. And a box comes up with, well, what settings do you want to paste? And we'll just select them all here. I think this is the default set. Had we cropped the image, you might pick that as well, but we didn't. So I'll just hit OK. And Bridge starts to go through all those images and updates all those settings. It applies the, the one process settings from the one image and applies them to all of them. And in moments, we've got 360-odd identically processed images. And that's what we need to begin our process of putting a time-lapse movie together. But very few programs can take these developed RAW files and turn them into a movie directly. Adobe After Effects will do it, but most of us need to go through the step of exporting these RAW files to create what's known as an intermediate set, a set of JPEGs. Here's one way to do that. So to create the intermediate frames, the ones we'll actually turn into the movie, let's go back to Bridge, and we can either select none of the images or select all of the images, either way works. But go under Tools, Photoshop, Image Processor. And Adobe Photoshop opens up and opens up with its utility called Image Processor. And this allows us to turn a whole folder of images into a folder of JPEGs in this case. In this case, we want to also select where we're going to save those images, save them as JPEGs, the best quality, 12, convert to the sRGB color profile, in this case works well, and then resize to fit, because we want to create frames that are the size of an HD movie, not the original full size of the of the DSLR images. So that's 1920 wide. In this case, it's 1280 high because I didn't crop them down to the more narrow widescreen aspect ratio of an HD movie. So resize to fit and then hit run. And away it goes. Photoshop now begins the process of opening up each and every one of those raw files with the processing settings applied and then saves them as a JPEG off in a separate folder resized, downsized, and it's that folder of intermediate JPEGs that we can turn into the movie. Well, time has passed. Uh, it takes a little while for Photoshop to, uh, to chunk through a folder of hundreds of raw files and turn them into our intermediate folder of JPEGs. But here they are, 360-odd uh, images, all downsized. There are many programs for taking such an intermediate set of JPEGs and assembling them into a time-lapse movie. Programs for Windows and for Mac, some free, some uh, very low cost. Uh, for Mac, I like a program called Sequence. But for this demo, I'm going to show you how you can use Photoshop and its little-known video editing capabilities. You can get at those capabilities by going up here to the Workspace Options here and select Motion. And a video timeline comes up timeline onto which we can put our JPEG images. Go under here, File, Open, and go to our folder of JPEGs. There they are. Select just the first one in the sequence, and then here's the trick. Click Image Sequence. 
and then hit open and a box comes up to say, well, what frame rate do you want to play those frames at? And uh, 30 is typical, but for auroras, often we might want to go a little slower frame rate, 15, in, the, in our case here, let's say. And in just a moment, there is our movie on the timeline. Press play, and you begin to see our little time-lapse movie. This is a Photoshop file. You can save this as a Photoshop file, even apply filters and adjustment layers to it. However, we'll just render it out as a movie, file, export, render video, and a dialog box comes up here where, of course, you can name the file, say where you're going to save it. The video codec, H.264, is usually uh, a good one. Uh, high quality here, the size, we'll leave that as the size that it was. Document frame rate, we'll leave that at 15, and just hit render. And very soon, it starts to export that video as a, as a playable QuickTime movie that you can play on its own or bring into any video editing software and turn into your Aurora time-lapse masterpiece. In our case, here's the finished result. So here's our movie starting off quite nice and then brightening very quickly in what's called a substorm, getting very bright for a few minutes of real time and then fading out and then as auroras often do, turning into sort of random flashing bits and then fading off. This is an hour and a half of roughly of auroral activity, 367 frames. Now that was a very nice aurora, but the next night, the sky went crazy. Warnings went out to be on the lookout for a great aurora across the sky as it got dark, and that's exactly what happened. I went out to the same lake where I had shot the tutorial, set up three cameras, shot thousands of frames, processed them all, just as I've shown you, and put together a final movie. This is just one clip from that sequence. To see the whole thing, check elsewhere in my video channel for the Great Salsus Aurora. So that was a quick tutorial on how to photograph and process the Aurora. For much more information on how to photograph and process all kinds of nightscapes and time lapses, I invite you to check out my 400 page ebook available exclusively at the Apple iBook Store. It contains dozens of embedded videos and step-by-step -step tutorials in a multimedia and interactive format. But I hope you've enjoyed this quick introduction to Aurora tips and techniques. I leave you with a short montage of Aurora time lapses. I wish you clear skies and happy hunting of the Aurora. Mm -hmm.